only certain way to avoid out of wedlock pregnancy? Well, yeah, I guess it would be you know, um, hard to get pregnant with. Uh, teaches in an age appropriate manner that abstinence is the only certain way to avoid the sexual transmissions of STDs and related health problems. Teaches the harmful physical effects of infection by STDs that may result from sexual activity outside the context of faithful marriage. Teaches the physical gains, blah, blah, blah. And here it is worth noting that people have done research on these abstinence only sex education programs, and they're abysmal failures. Um, that the kids who make, who sign up, you know, they, they, they take abstinence <coughs> pledges and they sign up and I don't know, they get a little gold star, I'm not sure what they get. Um, sociologists have done studies and the kids who uh, take abstinence pledges aren't as sexually active as those who don't take abstinence pledges, except there's one difference. Part of the abstinence only education programs are often lies and misinformation about sexually transmitted infections, including claims that condoms are totally ineffectual. That's sort of a standard in the abstinence-only sex education. And so when these abstinence pledgees go out and have sex, which they do at the same rate as their non-pledging comrades, they're much more likely to get sexually transmitted disease because they don't bother using condoms. Because the teachers say condoms don't work. Now the teacher's goal was to frighten the bejesus out of them so they wouldn't have sex. Well, they're still having sex, but they're not having safe sex. And so you see that the kind of thing that Crombie was doing back in 48 ties in perfectly with what's going on now. Um, can, 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 what part of that started under Clinton? Do you know? That I know. The exact history is confusing, but we know under Bush it has been abstinence only for federal funding for sex education. And that's why a lot of people have simply refused the federal funding in this area because they don't think that teaching abstinence only is the way to go. New York City refused. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, but, but I, I, it'd be worth doing the history here of Title V. Um, and uh, of this community-based absent education. I didn't spend too much time on it. But you have a thought or? Well, there was, uh, and also it was 1995, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal where they uh, admitted that the government was deliberately lying about the risks of AIDS and they explicitly stated because they wanted to discourage sex. But that was 95. Well, that, that's during a period when the Clinton is in, in power. Yeah. Um, re recall Clinton's reaction to Jocelyn Elders. Mm. And that might have been yeah, he, he had to. That could have been a technique. He had to. He did yeah. have to. Okay, well, you folks can duke that okay. out, but please don't duke it out of my time. Um, <laughs> and, uh, duke, it, but duke, duke it out. I mean, it's really worth talking about. Here, I'd like to talk about a similar reaction to Reich's work. Now, remember, Crombie's reaction to Reich's criticism and to Reich's suggestion that what we really need is sex affirming pamphlets was an attempt to throw the guy out of the country. And in retrospect, I believe only it would have been good if they had deported Reich right? and might have saved his life. Yeah. He'd gone to Germany, which at least now is far more receptive to his work. I don't know how it would have been in the late 40s, early 50s, but now uh, Germany is far more receptive to Reich's work than is the States, but that's probably because of the FDA and the, and the jailing and his, his murder. I just knew what he was trying to get him get immigrated. Yeah, he, there was various attempts to get him out of the country, but in any case, um, I wanted this to talk briefly. Yeah, I still have a little time here. I want to talk briefly about a parallel case to Reich's that happened recently, which is fascinating. And it's a book by um, Judith Levine called Harmful to Minors, The Perils of Protecting Children from Sex. I don't think this is a particularly good book. It's, it's a, one of these <coughs> liberal views of sex, pretty much anything goes kind of view of sexuality, which I think we want to clearly distinguish from a writing perspective. But it also has a lot of very interesting information. And one of the things you need to talk about and think about if we're talking about teen sexuality is the fact that there exist laws against it. And these are the so-called age of consent laws. And these laws are an absolute shamble. Um, so on the one hand, you have abstinence-only sex education. On the other hand, you have 
age of consent laws. So let me give you uh, some examples. In Canada, the age of consent is 14, which means that at 14 years of age, someone can legally consent to have sex with someone who's older, perhaps someone who's 17. Empirical data shows, and this again ties in with what you said, Kevin, um, there is typically an age difference of three years between boys and girls when they have sex. That typically, a 14-year-old girl's sexual partner is more likely to be 17 than he is likely to be 14. And this age difference between men and women as we get into adulthood is kind of interesting, and it'd be interesting to survey the room, but it does seem to be a pattern in our culture that men are typically older than women in their intimate relationships, because we mark it out when that's not the case. <laughs> she has a younger lover, you know, like that's, because it's, it's sort of atypical. The typical thing is that males are older. And, why that is, some people could argue maturation rates, or who knows why. But a typical teenager's sexual partner is going to be older than she is. And empirically, it's roughly three years. So imagine this 14-year-old Canadian girl getting involved with a 17-year-old boy living in Oregon. Um, she could be could accused of raping him since the age of consent in Oregon is 18. <laughs> and think about that. What the law does is says there's a difference between being willing and being able to consent. You can be willing to do something that you're not able to consent to do, legally speaking. Mm -hmm. And the age of consent is all over the place. My state of Connecticut, we're pretty cool. The age of consent is 15 with parents' permission. <laughs> so if your parents say, yeah, go have a love life, you can do it at 15. If you don't have your parents' permission, it's 16. Um, someone else's parents uh, in Iowa, In Iowa, it's 14 with parents' permission, but 18 without parents' permission. Parents' consent. And if one has parents' so, permission, one the other doesn't? So it's all over the place. And so let me just read a, a footnote from Levine's book. She says, most states allow youngsters to drive and even to marry before they may have unmarried sexual intercourse, legally speaking. In Massachusetts, as this writing, and this book came out in 2002, so she was probably writing in the late 90s, a person may marry at 12, but if someone who is not her husband inserts his finger into her vagina when she is 15, even with her expressed consent, he can be charged with statutory rape. In other words, statutory rape doesn't necessarily involve intercourse. It just involves contact with sexual parts. <clears throat> Under a section of the state's legal code entitled Crimes Against Chastity, taking a picture of her naked 17-year-old buttocks will earn the photographer up to 20 years in prison because that is sexual abuse of a minor because she's 17. At 18, she's a star on the internet. At 17, she is, a, well, I hope she wouldn't be a star on the internet, but you know what I'm talking about. The, you know, legally, you have to be 18 to close. So you have these total confused consent laws. Now, Levine has the courage to address this issue of consent. But by the way, her book is just, her, her book is just like what Reich said in response to Cromie. She said, the absence of this information will cause the problem you're trying to address rather than diminish it. Just as Wright said, the, these pamphlets will create juvenile delinquency rather than diminish it. So I just want to quote here from something that she said. In 